Hi, and welcome back. We're going to continue looking at nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy today, and we're going to reinforce some of the ideas that we talked about in terms of the M plus one rule and how the peaks split, but also look at chemical shift and what that tells us about the molecule that we're looking at. So with NMR, and we talked about, the x-axis is measured in what we call delta ppm, which is referred to as the chemical shift. The resonances or the peaks that we see, or the clusters of peaks, resonate at a different point along this axis, dependent on the energy that is required to cause the spin flips. This means that hydrogens attached to different groups will be influenced in different ways, resonating at different frequencies. Our alkyl chains, so our CH3, CH2s, tend to be quite low down in this region here at a peep delta ppm of around 1. Remembering that at 0 we have our tetramethyl silane, so with the silicon in the middle and our four CH3 groups hanging off it, this of course being our calibration point to actually mark zero on our scale. Mostly we will be looking for things within this region that are our alkyl groups, but we can also see here that a CH3 attached to something like a ketone where we have an electronegative oxygen is higher than a CH3 that is just bonded um, on its own in an alkyl chain to another carbon. So this presence of the oxygen can change where we see the peaks, remembering that the peaks are not going to be in an exact spot every time. The way the molecule is connected together influences the chemical shift, but it can be very powerful for us to be able to figure out where groups in a molecule are attached. The CH2s attached to an alcohol will resonate at higher than alkyl CH2s, whereas the hydrogen attached to the hydroxyl group will actually resonate out at a much larger range. We can see here that the hydroxyl of amino groups and alcohol groups can range all the way from 0.5 to 5. Um, these have quite a variable one, but you'll get used to seeing them. They'll be smaller, often won't have splitting, sometimes we will, but they'll be a bit broader and you'll get used to spotting these in the spectrum. But as soon as we start adding these electronegative groups, we see a shift to a higher value in the NMR spectrum for our protons. Also remembering that when we talk about spin-spin coupling patterns, this is the N plus 1 rule, these splitting patterns okay, have a fixed height ratio, so we will have a singlet which is a 1 line with no hydrogens next door, a doublet is 1 is to 1 and this means that there is one adjacent hydrogen triplet will be a 1 is to 2 is to 1, meaning there's two adjacent hydrogens, and a quartet will show us that there is three adjacent hydrogens in the ratio of 3 is to 1 is to 1 is to 1. We'll see quintets if we have symmetry in the molecule, and perhaps a CH2 on either side. This would cause a proton here to split into a quintet, and then septets we're going to see if we have three on either side. So the most likely ones you're going to come across are your singlet, doublet, triplet, and quartet. You may see quintets, and if you do, that is due to symmetry in the model, and same with a septet. This means that you would have a hydrogen that has two equivalent CH3s on either side of it with symmetry within the molecule. So let's start looking at chemical shift in a little bit more detail. When we're looking at high resolution spectra, we're talking about when the proton NMR peaks become more complicated. Remember we said that the number of peaks is equal to the number of different hydrogen environments within our molecule. When we have a high resolution spectra, which is largely all you see these days, these peaks split into clusters and these are influenced by the neighboring hydrogen atoms and we see predictable splits according to the number of neighbors that 
that proton can see. So if we have one peak, as I said before, we have a singlet. This is next door to a carbon with no hydrogens added. Because remember, the n plus 1 rule is how we determine splitting. It will be n, which is the number of adjacent hydrogens, plus 1 is the number of lines that the peak will split into. So this means for this, if we have zero adjacent hydrogens, i.e. the CH3 or CH2, or the hydrogen is isolated on its own by maybe a carbonyl or an ester functional group, then n plus 1 is going to be 1. If it is next door to a CH, n becomes 1, plus 1, we get 2. If it's next door to a CH2, we will now have 2 plus 1. We will see a characteristic triplet splitting. And if the proton that gives rise to the signal is next door to a CH3, plus 1, we will get a quartet splitting. So the splitting tells us the number of hydrogens attached to each carbon, and we call this the n plus 1 rule. So if we look at 1,1-dichloroethane, which we have here, we can see that we have a CH3 here that is in one environment, and this hydrogen here that is in another environment. This hydrogen will split into four lines. n plus 1 will equal 4 which is going to be a quartet. So we see this quartet here. And then the CH3 group will split into N plus 1 lines, which will be 2. We can see this is 0 here. Normally, we would see a CH3 down here at around 1. But the presence of these chlorine atoms have deshielded those protons, and we see that the shift moves up higher. So you would be looking for this in your data booklet in terms of hydrogens next to ACX, or just knowing that the presence of those chlorines will cause it to resonate at a higher frequency. Okay, so the hydrogen um, of the single hydrogen here will also be shifted up a bit higher than what a normal alkyl CH2 would be if we're looking at our reference table. So now if we change things up a little bit into having propane, we can see here that this environment is the same as this environment. So we have two environments. We would expect two sets of peaks, and that is in fact what we see. Remembering TMS is not from our molecule. It is tetramethylsilane and gives us our reference point at zero. These ones are much lower. We have no electronegative elements that are causing these to move. So these will be classic alkyl shifts in our uh, chemical shift table. We have this environment and this environment. For the CH3s, they are next to a CH2, so they will be n plus 1 lines is equal to 3, and this will be the triplet here for our CH3. However, for the CH2, it has these exactly the same type of hydrogens. Remember, these are one environment. So there are six of the same kind of hydrogen. So M plus 1 is equal to 7. And we see a septet here. We can see the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And we can see that nice pyramid kind of pattern to it, knowing that it's a true split. Looking at esters, esters are great um, for chemical shift and for splitting in helping us figure out what's going on within the ester. We've used color here, so these hydrogens correlate to this peak here. They are isolated from all the others, so M plus 1 is going to be 0 plus 1, so we see a singlet for these three hydrogens here. The CH2, however, is next to the CH3, so M plus 1, it will form a quartet, and this is the quartet that we see here. And then our CH3s, which will have the lowest chemical shift down here, the blue group here is going to be our CH3 next to, next to our CH2. And we can see that by the triplet splitting here of N plus 1 is going to be 3. So I want you to have a look at this one. This is the NMR spectrum of ethanol, CH3, CH2OH. Predict the number of environments that you would expect to see, the relative number of protons in each peak set. Remember that corresponds to our integral ratio. 
identify the groups that produce the peak sets A, B and C listed on the spectrum we see and explain the splitting that we observe. Pause the video, have a go at doing this one yourself and then come back and see what the solution is. Okay, hopefully you identified that in this molecule, sorry, in this molecule we will have three hydrogen environments. We will have the CH3 group here. We will have the hydrogens on the CH2 and of course the hydrogen from here. Looking at our chemical shift booklet table from our data book, we would expect that this will be at about 0 0.9 to 1 ppm. We would also expect it would have an integral ratio equal to 3. This will be 2. This will be 1. The CH2s we would expect to be a bit lower at about 2 or 1.8. Remembering though they are attached to an oxygen, so if we have a look in our data booklet we would expect these more around 4 ppm going directly into an oxygen. And then our hydroxyl here, we remember it's going to be anywhere between 1 and 5 ppm. This one we would expect to maybe split into three, but it could also just be a singlet because of the oxygen that we have here. As I said, sometimes we see splitting with these, often we don't. So that means that for the CH2, I would expect to see a quartet. And the CH3, I will expect to see a triplet. So when we look at this, 0 0.9 to 1, it's shifted up a little bit because of the nature of the alcohol. This will be my CH3, which is next to the CH2. And we have the triplet. This will be the CH2 with a quartet. So this will be the CH2. And this will be the hydrogen of the hydroxyl. So as we so essentially by looking at all of this we have answered the, the all the questions there's three environments the relative number of protons at each peak set would be 3 is to 2 is to 1 identify the groups that produce the peak a is going to be the hydrogens of the ch3 group b is going to be the hydrogen of the hydroxyl and c will be the hydrogens of the methyl group Peak A is split into a quartet or a quadruplet due to being adjacent to the CH3. And peak C is split into a triplet due to being adjacent to the CH2. Okay, very quickly we're just going to look at 13C NMR spectroscopy. You have a table for carbon-13 in your data booklet. It is used to identify different carbon environments in exactly the same way that we identify hydrogen environments. TMS is also used for a reference, but this time instead of being 0 to 12, we have 0 to 200 ppm as our chemical shift range. So if you're looking at a table that has chemical shifts up to 200, you're actually looking at the carbon-13 table. Make sure that you are using the right table for the right spectra. Carbon-13 don't typically show splitting of peaks, so all we're using this for is looking for the number of environments and checking chemical shift to perhaps identify carbonyl carbons or carbons that we may have been silent in um, the proton NMR spectrum because they don't have hydrogens attached to them. Unlike hydrogen, the area under the peak is not proportional to the number of carbons in these environments. Okay, so these are your chemical shifts for carbon. Again, our alkyl carbons, and remember this time we're looking at our carbons, not the hydrogens that are attached to them, but our carbons for alkyl groups are lower. Sorry. Let's change that back. Our carbons for alkyl groups are lower than when we have double bonds. They'll shift to a higher value again. And then in particular, we will often use this for finding the carbons of the carbonyls in our esters, aldehydes, and ketones. So high resolution NMR spectrum for carbon nuclei show no splitting. But if we have a look here at this ester, we can see that this will be our carbonyl of the ester. This will be the carbon that is next to the oxygen because they are most 
the further shifted. These three will be our alkyl carbons. From the spectra that you'll be given, it will often be difficult or impossible to identify which one will be the CH3 and CH2 because we don't have any information as to um, what these will be attached to. There are ways to find that out, but it's outside the scope of the course as we look at it. So just a note on MRI, because that's essentially all you need to know for carbon. MRI is magnetic resonance imaging. Some of you may have had one. It uses the same principles as NMR, but it scans for water levels in tissue because it's able to detect the density of hydrogen due to the hydrogens having a nuclear spin moment. But it uses much the same sort of technology. When you are being placed into the MRI machine, this is actually a large magnetic field. Um, and then the radio waves are pulsed through that in order to generate maps of the density of hydrogen within tissues in your body. Okay, that's it. Now it's just a matter of practicing all these spectra and putting it together so hopefully you're no longer confused and I'll see you in class.